Hey everyone, this is Ryan, and we're going to continue our discussion about evidence-based dentistry by talking about etiology, which is the third thing in our big three topics of EBD. So etiology um, is talking about the, the causes or risk factors associated with disease. And we can use two major study methods um, to figure this out. So prospective cohort studies uh, we saw in disease frequency, and they were concerned mostly with incidence, but this time we add in relative risk. And case control studies um, are concerned with odds ratios. So prospective cohort studies uh, 2.0 take a random, again, take a random sample of a healthy at-risk population. So this is going to be a population we know doesn't presently have disease, and they're also a population that are not immune, that is not immune to developing disease in the future. So what's different was when we just were curious about disease frequency, we took, we just left them all in one group. But now we take equal random samples of this population and place them into two groups or cohorts based on their exposure or not exposure to some risk predictor, some tr character trait or some environmental condition, um, something that we think could contribute to the, the incidence or the, the rate of developing new disease. And all other traits between these two groups should be equal. So a risk predictor can be categorized into two specific things. Risk factors are causally associated with disease. So this could be smoking and periodontal disease. Not only is it statistically linked, but it's also biologically linked. And we'll talk more about what that means later. And a risk indicator is just um, a marker of exposure to this risk factor. So in other words, halitosis or bad breath is collateral damage from smoking. It's just some side effect of smoking, and it's indirectly linked to having uh, periodontal disease, to an increased incidence of periodontal disease. So we can, again, find the incidence rate by taking the new diseased in a given time over one year or whatever, and divide that by the total population that we asked, the total sample at-risk population. So relative risk is our new calculation here. And this time, we take the incidence rate, so this, this whole fraction in people who are exposed to the risk predictor, divided by the people who are unexposed to the risk predictor. And then we can um, compare this we can to either 1, if it's greater than 1 or less than 1, um, and that tells us how what the um, connection is between the exposure and the disease. So if it's equal to 1, that these two values are equal, the incidence rates are no different between exposed or unexposed, then it's not associated with the disease. If the incidence rate in the exposed is greater, that means that there's an increased risk of developing disease if you're exposed to this thing. And if it's less than one, that means it's actually associated with decreased disease. So that means this risk predictor might actually be a treatment. And again, a random sample is just an estimate of the target population. So we have sampling variability. Um, remember, the study can statistically prove that a trait is a risk predictor, but biologic evidence from other studies is needed to prove it as a risk factor. Um, and the 95% confidence interval, I guess this is sort of applicable to any study, but it shouldn't be too wide, or else it automatically uh, means that you have a poor result. You can't, if, it's, if the confidence interval is way, way too big, then and the answer the actual answer could be anywhere in between here, um, or we're only ninety five percent sure it's here. It could 
even be out here or here, then that's just a that's just a bad result. But what we if it's a good a reasonable um, range of of possible results, we, then we check to see if it overlaps with the null value of one. So with disease frequency, we're comparing between two different studies or two different subgroups and see if those results, those confidence intervals overlap. This time we're just seeing if it overlaps with one specific value, the null value. And then again we have uh, p-value. And uh, it's important to note that um, multivariate uh, studies that consider that are, that adjust for usually lower the relative risk because they consider contribution from other risk predictors or risk factors. Um, so they, they try to narrow down the results based on the one um, risk predictor that we're testing. Okay, so then we have case control studies, which takes a random sample um, from a target population selected based on the presence or absence of disease. So instead of a healthy at-risk population, we're specifically asking people that have the disease and that don't have the disease. So this is the first study that's, that does this. And then we just place them into two groups based on whether they have the disease or they're a case, or if they don't have the disease and they're a non-case or a control, which is where it gets its name. Um, and again, everything else should be similar between the two groups because we're taking random samples. So case control studies, because we're looking back in time, we're essentially asking people, hey listen, did you uh, smoke? And we can maybe pick, take a link, make a link from people who answer yes and people who have the disease. Um, so that's sort of the, the how we get odds. We can say how many people um, were exposed to this risk predictor and how many were unexposed. And then we take the odds in all the people who have the disease and divide that by the odds of all the people who don't have the disease. And this gives us an odds ratio. So maybe uh, take a couple of minutes, pause the video, and see if you can um, calculate the odds ratio for this um, scenario, for this table. Okay, how'd you do? Let's check it out. So um, I think the most helpful way to tackle a question like this would be to take the table and translate it into familiar terms. So you notice how we had smokers and non-smokers here. Smoking is our risk predictor. So we just say um, exposed and unexposed. And then I'll go back once more. Uh, periodontal disease and not no periodontal disease um, relates to either someone who has has a disease who's a case and someone who's a control. So once you figure that out, you can sort of um, translate the table and then just plug in the numbers based on um, where they went for odds and odds ratio. So we'd put um, the for the cases we we do forty divided by five and that would be the odds for the cases and then we do the odds for the controls and then we just divide the two odds case divided by control and get four. So someone who's exposed to the risk predictor of smoking is actually four more four times more likely to get periodontal disease over time. Now the problem with case control studies is that prospective cohort studies are superior because they can measure the exposure prior to the onset of disease. While case control studies, you're just looking back in time. So they could have gotten the disease and then be exposed to the supposed risk factor. You wouldn't know. Uh, so that's sort of the limitation to this study. And of course, we have to do take into account sampling variability anytime we take an estimate of the target population. And again, we have to see if it overlaps with the null value of 1. 
So how do you upgrade from a risk predictor, from being a risk predictor, um, to becoming a risk factor? Well, the first thing, you need to have a strength of association. So you need to have a relative risk much greater than one. And this can be calculated using a prospective cohort study. Then you should have a consistency of association, reliable results, in other words, between different populations, different times, um, and other, and other um, different characteristics you can think of. There should be a specificity of the association. Only, you should only be researching about one disease. Um, there should be temporality. The exposure must provide disease onset, which we were just talking about, which case control studies can't do. This is something that only prospective cohort studies can ensure that the exposure was before the disease onset. Plausibility is biological evidence. This is the main thing that you need. You need to be able to biologically link um, this characteristic to the disease, that it actually caused it. And then you can um, bring in some intervention with doctors and, and undergo clinical trials. Great, well I hope this video was helpful and uh, check out my next video where I'll be talking about treatment efficacy. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.